Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. My name is Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa out at the North Shore. And today's a very special day because it's going to be our last show for the foreseeable future. I hope to be back sometimes to talk to you again, but nobody knows what the future will bring. So we're just going to go with uh, this show, which I think that you'll enjoy because it's certainly one of my favorites. It's the joy of reading. Uh, originally, we had planned to do the joy of summer reading, but that was when we were thinking, well, we should do it at the end of May or beginning of June. So uh, we had to move it up because of the time schedule now for Think Tech Hawaii. So we're here today and we're going to talk about not only <clears throat> the joy of summer reading, but the joy of all reading, including fall reading, winter reading, and spring reading. So we'll be talking about that. And I'm very fortunate to have my good friend and uh, children's librarian from the Wailua Public Library, Ms. Holly Braffitt. Holly, welcome to the show. Hi, Ken. Thanks for having me on again. It's, I'm always happy to talk about books and library joy. So I'm happy to be here. Me too. You know, books played a very important part for me in my early life and uh, in my midlife and in my later life. <clears throat> They've always been there. They've always been friends. They've always been an inspiration. So it's just a joy for me to talk about that. And maybe a good place to start, since we mentioned summer reading, uh, which is genre reading. And a lot of people, when summer rolls around and they get a vacation, <clears throat> they like to return to something that's very comfortable. And a lot of people are comfortable with specific genres in books. It could be mysteries. It could be romances. It could be science fiction. It could be fantasy. Any number of types of reading all depending upon what the individual likes. So I guess that would be my first question uh, to ask of you, Ali. Uh, in your review of the upcoming books that are coming up, have you seen any of those genre favors that people may like who have a particular genre that they're interested in? Oh, yes. Um, lately, I've been the one who's been in the back room of the library processing all the new books, and I love getting my hands on the new titles before Anybody else has seen them, so I know what they're in store for. Uh, we got the new Douglas Preston book. Um, I think it's called Extinct, and it looks like a neat twist on sort of a Jurassic Park sort of plot. Um, and that one looked really interesting. We've got the new Rita Mae Brown book. It's um, She's got these cozy cat mysteries, and the newest one just came out. And, um, oh, Ken Follett just wrote another book, and he takes forever writing his books, and they're always worth it when you finally get your hands on them. They're enormous, and he's got a new one out. And I also saw one by one of my favorites, um, Ann Hillerman, who is the daughter of Tony Hillerman. And I used to live in Arizona, so I love the Tony Hillerman um, Lee Porn and Chi mysteries. And his daughter has just picked it right up and she's just as good a writer as her father was. And it's the same characters that we know and love. So if you also are into mysteries and westerns, you should be excited to know that Ann Hillerman's new book is coming out, has just come out. I had, I'm processing it right now. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, give me a call at the library and I'll put it on hold for you. I was going to mention on that, <clears throat> I was looking it up and I was interested because I hadn't realized that she was Tony Hillerman's daughter. And yeah. when I found out, I said, oh, yeah, because I'm not familiar with her books, but I certainly was familiar with his books. And uh, they were yeah. certainly a unique type of mystery, uh, not only for the setting, but for the culture and everything. And I was especially interested, and I was going to ask you about it, about as she's carried on with this and very successfully, she's added a woman detective to it. And uh, Bernadette, and I was going to ask you about her. Oh, I haven't read the latest ones. I'm I'm a little bit behind, but that's exciting. Now I now I'm definitely going to check it out before anybody else gets it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think but, it was about time that we got a woman detective in there. <clears throat> yeah, I, I the, love the idea guy. that um, as a as a father and daughter, she's she he had to have been telling her stories as she grew up, you know? And so she's got to be even more familiar with all of these characters in this world than any of us readers could be. So I'm, I think it's so great when the children of authors pick up, pick it up and keep going. Yeah. yeah. And if they're equally talented and sometimes yeah. they're not, but from what you're saying, I'm looking forward to seeing some of Anne's and reading some of Anne's books. 
Yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, that sort of is affects all uh, genres is the fact that uh, when we're <clears throat> looking for a book, <clears throat> Uh, whether it's one of our favorite genres or whether it's a new and different book, uh, what we're really looking for is something that we haven't seen before. Uh, <clears throat> things that sort of we look at it and we start reading and we say, gee, I've never read anything quite like this before. And I was wondering if you had come up with any of these new different type of titles and books and authors that you in, in the back room where you've been working on that. Yeah. Um... When I'm thinking about, you know, new, trying something different and trying something new, um, for a lot of people, you know, it's easy to switch between fiction genres, um, but especially in the summertime, I like to explore different skills. I want to learn something new. And I was looking at some of the new books that were coming through the library, and um, we've got ones that are a couple years old. Like there's one called um, <sighs> Ladies Drawing Night. And that one, it, it's great because it has a whole like weeks long plans where you have these Friday night parties with art and it'll give you a lesson plan of what your art project for that evening is going to be. And some of them, they're, they're very clever and they're really nice. And you don't have to even, you know, you don't have to come up with the ideas yourself. They're all right there and they're doable, you know, for even somebody who's just learning how to do art and um, also cookbooks. So one of the ones I saw that, that came across my desk was the Netflix, the official Netflix cookbook. And when I was browsing through that, um, it's got all of the, the really popular shows like um, Stranger Things and Bridgerton. And uh, it has menus for having viewing parties. So you can invite your friends over and you can binge on these shows and you can have a tea party with the Bridgerton ladies. And um, you can have really retro, like weird waffle creations while you're watching Stranger Things. And it's got all kinds of shows and some really great ideas. So I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, I love, personally, the thing I'm getting weird about right now is um, 17th century Dutch painting. So I've been looking up all of these old books it doesn't have to be a brand new book it can just be a new skill it can be a new interest that you have and you can go down that rabbit hole and the library's got it for you we can find you something about anything <laughs> and um ooh, sorry i lost my train of thought there for a second because what i've been doing at home today is i've been making these little miniatures we're making a book nook with my with my kids and it reminded me that We've got books on woodworking. We've got books on miniatures. You can learn to make things. You don't have to buy a kit. You can go to your library and you can find some great ideas for things to do during the summer. You can build um, outdoor furniture. You can build a greenhouse finally, if that's what you've been putting off. We've got plans for, for all of that. So I think uh, come down to the library and explore your interests and we'll find something good for you. Oh, well, that sounds terrific. Absolutely. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that uh, I was especially interested in because, uh, you know, the show here is, you know, as you've known, because you've been on the show before, and uh, we're trying to find happiness in hard times and uh, do that. There are a lot of books out that sort of uh, document these hard times that we're living in. And uh, and that's great as far as, uh, <clears throat> you know, helping us explore how to avoid hard times, how to handle hard times, how to deal with hard times. Uh, but it's not the most happy task that we have. And a lot of times we just need to feel good. And what I found any time that I felt overwhelmed or a little down is that books can Bring me that happiness and elevate my mood and make me smile while I'm reading, even if I haven't been smiling at all that day. And I was wondering uh, about books that you've come across uh, in the back room that, uh, you know, which fits sort of that category or that genre of just we can read it and we can feel good after we're finished with it and, uh, and be on that road to happiness. Have you run across some of those? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a children's librarian, so this year when they announced the 
Newberry and Caldecott winners. I was actually there. I was at the conference, the ALA conference, while they announced it live to the world, and I uh, was in the audience. And I had to get my hands on them. And the winner this year for the Newberry Award um, is The Eyes and the Impossible by Dave Eggers. And I know a lot of people are very familiar with Dave Eggers, but I hadn't read him before. I'd read McSweeney's a little bit, and he's one of the writers on, on that site. But um, I had to, I picked up this book and it was beautiful. It's about this dog named Johannes and he's fast. He's faster than the wind. He's faster than light. He's faster than sound. Do you think you can see him? You can't see him. He's too fast. He's just a dog running around in a park, of course, but it's, it's wonderful. He's the eyes of the park. He reports to the bison along with the assistant eyes. There's a one-eyed squirrel and a raccoon and a pelican, and his best friend, a seagull named Bertrand. And they survey the park and they report everything back to the bison. But one day at the park, it's this big park, it's, it's not a particular park, so you get to imagine it however you want. They have you know, a visitor center, they've got a pond, they've got like an ice rink, they've got all kinds of attractions at this park. And one of the things they bring is an art show. And Johannes has never seen art before and it mesmerizes him and it engrosses him it fills him with inspiration and he gets an idea to do something impossible and with the help of his friends he does <laughs> and it is the most uplifting inspiring beautifully written book that i've read in a long time and it's not just for children like the way it's written it will make you feel nourished after you're done reading it you know uh, so i recommend anybody go out and read the eyes and the impossible because it's definitely been my favorite book of the year so far and uh, the other one i wanted to mention was ferris by kate di camillo which comes with a, a sort of a sad tale on my part um, when i was at the conference a couple months ago i had the chance to meet kate di camillo I was very excited. I listened to her speech and it was very moving, a beautiful speech. And she talked a bit about writing this book. Um, in this book, she wanted to write about a child who was loved from the very beginning, unconditionally loved. So many stories and even ones she's written too, you know, some tragedy has befallen the child. They've lost a parent. Um, they're off on the wrong foot immediately. And she says, well, what would happen if that wasn't the case. And this was a child who was wanted and loved from the moment she entered the world. And so it's a, it's a lovely book. I waited in line for a long time to get my hands on an advanced copy of it and, and for her to sign it. And I got, this is, this is my embarrassing tale. I got all the way up to the front and I, I met her and I said, hello. And she wrote, you know, my daughter's name in the book. And then I had to tell her how much um, the Beatrice Prophecy meant to me. I think I mentioned that on our last show, The Beatrice Prophecy is a beautiful book. Except at the very last second, as I was saying it, my brain forgot what it was doing, and I said The Beatrice Chronicles, and I didn't realize it until I was walking away with my copy of the new book in my hands, and I was like, no! <laughs> that was my one chance to make an impression on Kate DiCamillo, and I said the name of her book wrong! <laughs> It's going to keep me up at night for the next 20 years. But Ferris is a beautiful book also, and I recommend that to everyone. <laughs> the thing about a good book, even if it's a ch children's book, um, it'll have appeal to adults. So I know I'm pitching kids' books right now, but go read them. They're really good. But I do have um, an adult book to pitch that I saw crossing my desk this week, and that was a new book by Terry Pratchett. And um, as we know, Terry Pratchett passed away in 2015. It's one of my favorite authors. Um, so I was very excited to see that these are the lost stories. These are short stories by Terry Pratchett that have been published posthumously and posthumously. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just picked it up yesterday and I have only just started reading it, but it feels like having a conversation with an old friend, you know, if, if you have read and loved Terry Pratchett. It'll feel just very warm and comforting to have him back in your hands again. And if you haven't read Terry Pratchett, you need to read Terry Pratchett. The, <laughs> his Discworld series is so funny 
and insightful and sharp-witted, you know, people have an attitude about fantasy books because they look very silly and the covers are kind of ridiculous. But Terry Pratchett had a very sharp mind and he was so funny. And uh, I just, I can't say enough good things about his books. So go read that one too. All right. <clears throat> well, you know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, all three of those authors, which are, uh, I'm not familiar with Kate, but uh, she certainly sounds interesting. I'm certainly looking forward to her, to her book. I know uh, David Eggers, Eggers and uh, Terry Pratchett, and uh, I really enjoy their books. Uh, I'm in a number of book clubs, and uh, the uh, sort of the all-encompassing book club was, uh, we did, read a couple of Eggers' books, uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this new one. And I'm also looking forward to the found Terry Pratchett book, which we We've talked about four of his books in my science fiction and fantasy uh, book club over, over the years. My favorite being The We Free Men. Oh, which yeah. Was a, which was just a great book. and uh, But all of his books are delightful. His imagination is terrific. And speaking of, uh, you know, if we're looking at uh, Kate and we're looking at uh, Terry, uh, two of their books are have young uh girls as the heroines. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kate has a uh, 10 year old and uh, uh, in the, uh, the <clears throat> in the, uh, what is it? Beatrice Prophecy. Yes, yes. Not the, the Chronicles. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, Pratch the, one, uh, the Pratchett one has uh, a nine year old. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people talk about the uh, masculinity uh, unbalance in in books and uh and even in in children's books but i grew up with uh, uh dorothy from kansas and uh alice from wonderland and um, my great fantasy books in childhood was always had that uh the young girl as the heroine and yeah. uh, doing spectacular things and uh so uh these these books from these authors are uh, really looking forward to um the Edgar's books, uh, you know, you, you know he, uh, you know, a lot of his stuff is adult, uh, but uh, he also is the inspiration for a number of movies. And uh, the two movies that I particularly enjoyed was The Circle that he wrote, and that turned into a film, and uh, the uh, what was the other one? Oh, uh, The Hologram for a King which I loved because it had a romance of people who were going on senior citizens, which really <laughs> made me have a great time. And both of those movies, by the way, star Tom Hanks, which <laughs> was very interesting. So I think uh, I watched The Circle a little too close to reading the book, and I got so mad because they changed the ending, and the ending was the whole point of it. Yeah, I read The Eyes and the Impossible, and he was so inspiring and and delightful and so i was like oh i'm gonna read all of dave, dave eggers books and the first one i read was the parade which is a shorter book and it's very well written and it is such a bummer i mean i really enjoyed it and i do recommend it i was like wow dave okay so then i read the circle and it just destroyed me <laughs> i'm still recovering weeks later i just read the every and i'm like okay that's the sequel to the circle they're gonna they're going to solve the problem this time. Oh, Dave, Dave is, <laughs> he's doing a number on me. Um, well, they I, changed the movies. You know, they changed the yeah. books on a lot of the movies. And it's hard not to get upset. You know, yes. if you read the book. But I was lucky with the circle to. because I saw the movie. I hadn't read the book. Mm. And uh, although the movie was not the most uh, feel-good movie in the world, uh, I did enjoy the acting, and especially uh, Tom Hanks was amazing tackling a role that oh, he's always so amazing anyway because he tackles all these different roles, and he makes you believe in that. And certainly, this was a, a different role from him compare it to uh, you know what he did with uh, you know uh, you know uh, my friend uh, you know the television program when he played the the, the neighbor. Uh, and, oh, oh, man called O was that. Oh wait, no. Well, he was—he was, he was oh, great wait. too. He did that as well. It was but, an, uh, a similar one. Oh, gosh, you know, the kids—the kids, the kids uh, 
program of uh, the, the oh the, oh 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 when he did the the Fred Rogers yes yes movie. I Mr. haven't Rogers. seen that one yet it's on my to do I think I'm gonna cry too much so I keep putting it off <laughs> <laughs> I love Mr. Rogers but anyway I'm sorry that uh, that that bummed you out about the circle that does happen but I loved it but mm-hmm. whoa yeah I was expecting. From from the eyes and the impossible, you know, it's all light and joy. And I can see now that he is he's doing this for the children. He's giving them here, here, have some art and nature and inspiration and joy. And then when you're an adult, we can rip it all away. <laughs> and you can see what you might lose if you don't value those things, you know. Exactly, because his adult books are focusing on problems that we adults are screwing up. You know, yeah. he's trying to point that out to us and say, you know, we're headed in the wrong direction. Let's change planes. Yeah, you know? but he's absolutely um, right. You don't need to point that out to children. You need to make them appreciate those things first <laughs> to show them how great nature and art and, you know, friendship and love is. And then you know what you can lose later. Yeah. Well, that's one of the points I wanted to make toward the end of the show, which we're getting toward, is the fact that uh, as an adult, I can really enjoy children's books. And as a child, when I was like five or six, my mother was reading Oscar Wilde to me. My mother believed that uh, there was something to be learned in great writing, you know, whether it was a quote, you know, an adult book or not an adult book or a children's book or a young adult book. Uh, So I was exposed to a lot of different adult, uh, you know, readings when I was young. And uh, they made an impression and a good one. Uh, because uh, I may not have understood a lot of what some of the, you know, the quote, adult themes were being too young, but I could get into the flow. I could feel uh, the words, uh, which was an amazing thing. So uh, what I wanted to say to people, uh, especially parents, was enjoy the children's books again when you read them to your kids. And even if your kids have left, don't hesitate to pick up a children's book the one that you've loved, especially when you were young, and read it again and just enjoy that wonderful feeling and imagination that goes with that that we oftentimes miss as an adult. So, uh, And that's one of the reasons why I am I so value Holly as the children's librarian, because uh, that is so important uh, in a library, is to bring young kids in and help them to the joy, finding the joy in reading. And I always really appreciated all the work that you've done on that topic. Oh, thank you. I want to just add on to that a little bit is that parents also don't be afraid to read those favorite, uh, not at your age level books that were read to you as a child. My mother read The Hobbit to me when I was five. You know, It doesn't matter if the book is over your child's reading level. If you love it and you enjoy reading the book with your child, they will feel that and they're going to get something out of it. So if a good book is a good book. A good children's book is a good book for an adult. A good adult book mostly is a good ch- book for a child if, if you want to share that with them. Don't worry about it. Just read what you love. Great advice. Uh, and thanks again for being with me again. Uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, being here. And uh, what I'm now is going to do is sort of just do a recap of uh, all the shows that we've done in the past two years and four months. Uh, but before that, I wanted to say uh, to thank Holly again for being with me. I couldn't think of a better topic for a last show and uh, a better person to share it with. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. My favorite topic, and I hope someday... You know, if you get your show, go on again. I'll be happy to join you again. Thank you. Uh, as a review, let me just uh, go over uh, these, like I said, two years and four months, which has been pretty amazing for me. And it's been amazing because I've had some ma- amazing people on my show. I've done 58 shows, uh, and I've had uh, shows, yes, on 56 of those 58 shows. Uh, and they are so many people. Uh, what Michael is going to do is he's going to put these available to you to uh, to read. And I wanted uh, all those shows to sort of go into the archives because I wanted to say thanks again to all the people who have come on this show and all the different areas that we've explored. 
the first half of my run on this uh, with Think Tech Hawaii was with a show called Coronavirus and Our Mental Health. And as a psychologist, I was interested in helping psychologists and future counselors uh, understand the mental health problems associated with coronavirus and how to help them that way. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, we were focused on the medical and physical sides. And I wanted people to be aware of the tremendous problems that we were having and developing because of the lockdown and the pandemic associated with the coronavirus. And so that was the wellspring for the first part of my shows with Think Tech Hawaii. And like I said, about half of them, but halfway through that first half, I started realizing that the way to help people who were stuck in the negativity, everything that was going on in the world, plus not being able to get support from close friends and family because of the lockdown, that the way to reach them was not to preach at them or not to try to teach them so many new things, but to make them feel good. Because once you feel good, once you feel happier, once you sort of exit that world of shadows, you're able to do more things. You're able to get in there and relive your life as far as, uh, you know, instead of being stuck in front of the internet or the television and listening to all the negativity that's going down. Because remember, negativity sells when we're talking about media. And it's not that the media is doing bad things to us, it's that they're appealing to our interests in tragedies. Uh, and we unfortunately are not so much interested in the joys. And so I wanted to counteract that with the program. And I started to do that during the, corona, the coronavirus pandemic in that first part of, of my shows that I was doing for Think Tech Hawaii. And we did things like the joy of cooking, the joy of bicycle riding. It was, it was great. And, and of course, the joy of books, the joy of art, the joy of music. Uh, and so finally, I said, you know, we're doing shows and the title doesn't fit anymore. Let's find a better topic. And that's when we came to finding happiness in hard times. And that continued the joy that I and I hope the audience uh, found. Because if you, even for 30 minutes, which our show is, can feel some happiness, can know that other people are finding happiness and how they're doing it, uh, we can relate to that and we can be encouraged to find our happiness because our happiness is different than everybody else's. Um, it's our own unique way, our own unique path. And if there's anything that happened in these shows that sort of inspired you to find your way to happiness, then everybody, all the guests and I will have done our job or at least contributed to something uh, that is really important. I think. So with that, I want to thank again all my guests, and please do take a look at the list that uh, Michael is going to put up in our archives and make available to viewers so you can see once again the topics that we covered and uh, get the credit that all those people who came on and gave of themselves and their thoughts uh, and their feelings to our show, uh, to give them credit, uh, which I totally appreciate, just like I appreciate it. Holly coming on today. I appreciated everybody. Uh, and especially those uh, people that, like Holly, that I talked into coming on more than once, which was always a wonderful thing. And, uh, and getting to know people, getting to know people who are happy. And that's a key thing. So, with that, I'd like to, again, as I always do, once again, thank all the people at Think Tech Hawaii, uh, to thank Jay and to thank Michael and to thank Haley and Carol and all the people who made this possible over all the years. I may have been here only two plus years, but this show has been going over 21 years. And they brought a lot of information and, uh, and interest to the people of Hawaii. Uh, and so uh, I think everybody should be appreciative of that. And I look forward to uh, them working with their archives and some ad hoc shows down the line as well. So finally, Thank you, the audience, who what this is all about. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. And please, keep trying to find your happiness in these hard times. Aloha.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.